Cyberpunk 2077 is a game set in a technologically advanced future where our protagonist takes on mercenary jobs for money. They spend a lot of time in the desert and are easily the most badass person in any combat scenario. The Mandalorian is a show set in a technologically advanced and far away past where our protagonist takes on bounty hunter mercenary jobs for money. They spend a lot of time on desert planets and are easily the most badass person in any combat scenario. And since the Mandalorian season 3 dropped like literally yesterday, I figured now was the perfect time to try a Mandalorian build in Cyberpunk. We're going to explore all of the perks, cyberware, weapons and vehicles that you need to become Mandalore's finest and rule the streets of Coruscant, uh, I mean Night City. So without further ado, let's get to it. As with any build video, we need to start with the basics of attributes and perk points. Since Din Djarin is a multi-talented individual, this is going to be a somewhat varied perk set. But without a doubt, the first areas to focus your attribute points are reflexes and tech, since this will allow us to quickly level the damage of our weapons into the one-shotting devices seen in the show. For assault perks, you want to spec into anything specifically improving damage, as much like Mando, we'll be making heavy use of an immensely powerful sniper rifle. Handguns too want whatever boosts to damage and draw speed you can afford for those badass western moments and general mid-range combat. Finally, for reflexes, Din is the wielder of the Darksaber, meaning we ought to buy up some blade perks to ensure we aren't outmatched in close quarters combat. Although, to be fair, the Darksaber is a difficult blade to yield and it may actually be more lore accurate to spec nothing into blades and just struggle a bit. That one's up to you though and you can spend the spare perks on more assault and handgun stuff if you want. But personally, this is what I'm going for. The tech tree is also very important since Mando is proven to be a pretty skilled craftsman. Perks allowing us to craft better gear therefore a top priority here as with most builds. Then specking into the tech and power perks from engineering will improve the tech capabilities of our sniper and ricochet of our pistol. The next one is still very important but secondary in my opinion to tech and reflexes. By specking points into body we're not only channeling the badass tank aspects of the warriors of Mandalore but high body points are what we'll need to unlock the best berserks. More on that in a bit but perks for body then are anything that improves armor rating or allows us to do badass things like shoot with a body or reload while sprinting. And coming in at a very low fall, once you're in the end game, you may want to chuck remaining attributes into cool for some bonus cold blood effects and the ability to equip the heat resistant armor. So to sum that up, tech and reflexes first, then slowly bring in body around level 20 and finally cool for the end game. Now that that's out of the way, it's time for a visit to Coruscant's cybernetic surgeons. Or just Ripperdox, we could still just call them that. Starting from the top left with cyberware, Din's initial hatred of droids would suggest that Mechatronic Core is a perfect fit, improving all our damage to droids and mechs. Then when it comes to Kuroshi Optics, you can bring them in warm or you can bring them in cold. When specifically aiming to take targets alive then, you'll want to equip the target analysis mod for non-lethal damage. For operating system, my top berserk here will be the Zeta Tech Mark V for improved gunplay and armor. Though you could go with any legendary berserk here and get different benefits. It's not exactly a canonical aspect to a Mandalorian, but I figured it more fitting than slowing down time or hacking people's brains. Either of those are obviously better reserved for a Jedi. The Bioconductor and Nano Relays will improve our Berserk duration and cooldown, whilst the Second Heart and Biomonitor will ensure a downed Pedro Pascal will always get back up. Just pretend it's Grogu using Force Healing or something. For Immune System, I figured Induction would be a cool feature emulating Mando's armor. Beskar is said to be a heat resistant alloy and not very conductive, therefore I think this is technically accurate. Same with the fireproof coating, grounding plating and subdermal armor. All of these I think emulate the properties of Beskar. Skeleton upgrades will then improve our skill with ranged and melee weapons and for hands and arms we have a few options. The projectile launcher and smart link can emulate the whistling bird seeker missiles whilst the monowire can emulate the grappling hook, kind of. Or else you could just straight up go with griller arms and fist your way through Night City's underworld, a method which I hear is particularly effective on Jig Jig Street. Which of the three arms you choose here is ultimately up to you and it's kind of a shame we can't use all three at once like Din Djarin can. Finally, we don't get a jetpack in this game, but the best way I've found to emulate that is using the triple jump mechanic. This will require the epic fortified ankles and the maneuvering system. You can also add rogues rocket boots if you want to cheat and use console commands. The details for where to find each of these are in the description and I have other videos on this channel covering Ripperdox and cyberware if you want to know more. Got any credits left after that? Well good, because it's time to go shopping for a Razor Crest, as well as a tuned up Naboo Starfighter. 
Now, when it comes to finding the Razor Crest, I narrowed it down to a couple potential options. Beast is a car acquired for free after completing the Beast in Me racing quests with Claire. It's pretty large and fits the bulky vibe and colour scheme that the Razor Crest has. Else, you can pick up the Thornton Little Mule from the Sunset Motel in the Badlands. Again, a reasonably bulky pickup, which to me sports more of the outsider nomad vibe of a lone wanderer. Also, it's a reasonable 35,000 credits, uh, uh, I mean, eddies, and can be bought fairly early on. Unfortunately, I get the feeling that your Razor Crest car is going to wind up in a terrible accident, and the only way to overcome this sad news will be to acquire a smaller but faster ship, uh, car. The Rayfield Caliburn can be acquired for free down in this Badlands tunnel, but if you're determined to truly stick as close to Star Wars lore as you possibly can, then there is a white and gold one in the city centre, but it's 127k. If you've completed enough gigs though, this one stays more true to the colours of an original Naboo Starfighter. It's easily the fastest car in the game, clocking out at a speed speed of 211, and I'm sure Grogu will love it when you accelerate really fast. But if you don't have that kind of money, then the Type 66 Avenger is actually more fitting to Din Djarin's specific colour scheme, whilst also looking and sounding incredibly cool. It'll be a slightly cheaper 75,000 eddies and can be found in the Corpo Plaza. Great. Now that we have all those, it's time to explore the arsenal of our Mandalorian weapons. As I've already said, I'll be using a sniper, pistol, and darksaber stand-in to encompass the most popular parts of Din Djarin's weapon arsenal. For starters, we need a stand-in for the Amban sniper rifle, an exceptionally powerful tool straight up capable of vaporizing foes. And I can think of none better to fill this role than the Necomata tech sniper, which will benefit greatly from all the tech perks we bought earlier. I'll personally be using the iconic variant Breakthrough, which can not only pierce walls, but also occasionally ricochets. I'm not sure that's entirely in keeping with the Amban sniper, but it's also just the superior Nekamata, in my opinion. I cover the differences in more detail in my Sniper's Ranked video. Then we have to choose a revolver or pistol, and whilst Mando's blaster clearly leans more into a tech revolver vibe, there's just one thing in this game that I absolutely can't ignore. The Malorian is not only one syllable short of our hero's namesake, but the silver colouring and design look like it would fit right in with a set of Beskar armour. What's more, despite being a power pistol, the Malorian does have a unique ability to penetrate penetrate walls and ricochet, both of which are qualities we've seen from blasters. Also by slapping four combat amplifiers onto this gun's mod slots, we can gain a 20% chance each to bleed, poison, shock or burn. Though alternatively, we could just slap on some crunch mods for boosted all-round damage. At the same time, I definitely found this to be the weakest of my three weapons, and it may be worth trading out for the Comrade's Hammer or a regular Bullier to more heavily exacerbate the one-shotting aspect, so fair play to you if you instead decide to go with one of these. More info on pistols can be found in my pistols ranked video, with revolvers having their own separate one. Finally, we need a dark saber. And whilst this glowing black blade has an effect we can't replicate in Cyberpunk, if we lose the glow, we can get pretty close. Jinshu Maru is a katana with a dark aesthetic, and if you trade out your nano relays for Korenzakov, you can get 100% crit damage with this, in the way I'd imagine the dark saber would have permanent crit damage too. Also, acquiring this one involves defeating Oda, which fits with the whole one from its previous owner thing. But there's other katanas you can choose if you so wish, with my katanas ranked video covering all of them. Well now that we're armed for mercenary work, it's time to don a helmet and never show our face again. Now, annoyingly, a full set of Beskar doesn't exist in this game, so I decided to scroll through the item lists to find some street-level Mandalorian gear. We have the reinforced visored helmet for obvious reasons, and then a blue reinforced composite breastplate, which I went for partly since I couldn't find a silver one, and this at least is still a popular colour worn by the likes of Django Fett. Then I went for this biker turtleneck to reinforce that colour scheme, but stuck with my classic duo layer slim fits because, well, you all seem to like them. Finally, I went for this oversized pair of worn exojacks. Now, a top tip for changing your appearance without having to swap out the best pieces of your armour is to create an outfit in your wardrobe. Cosmetically, we can now appear like this, and changing our clothing for stat bonuses doesn't change our appearance. That's really useful here because I summoned the common versions of these as an appearance baseline with console commands, so they don't have good stats at all. In order to find them legitimately, I'd suggest checking enemy loot and visiting clothing stores. But since the store in this game are all very RNG, I annoyingly can't provide specific locations for specific clothing items, but at least you know what to look for now. Clothing mods are of course something to aim for too, with armadillo being the obvious for improved armor rating, but there's also ones that allow you to run faster and improve specific resistances. Fantastic, now that we finally feel and look the part, it's time to head to the afterlife for some bounty hunter gigs. 
Hey, Rogue, my favorite. Not for you. Ah. With our fixer not coming through for us, our chances at being a true Mandalorian were starting to look dire. But then, I had a genius idea. If we can't be hired for local jobs, we can instead go out onto the lower levels of Coruscant, help the innocent, and demand that they pay us money. So, setting off in our poor man's razor crest, we began to look for crime. Twelve seconds later. Aha, Night City's finest, embroiled in a shootout to the death. I'm sure if I intervene here, I'll be rewarded handsomely. Okay, good. Combat stopped and- wait. Wait, where are you going, fellas? I think I, uh, think I deserve a few credits, don't you? A few Eddies? A few Edisons? No? It seems that the police weren't cooperating, so it was time to try out my track darts to hold them to ransom. But there too, it seemed like they were two steps ahead, with the darts having zero effect on any of them. Moving on then, it was time to test the build in proper combat. And where better to do so than this hive of scum and villainy down in the Badlands. So a few things I found with this build. Firstly, switching weapons was not just a matter of preference, but a matter of need. We can pick off our first combatants with the Nekamata, then switch to our pistol as they begin to swarm us, before finally pulling out the Darksaber to go half Jedi on them. The armor boosts offer useful protection, whilst the second heart and biomonitor serve as great backups if we do lose too much health. Also, traversing the terrain with the hover legs does offer some great versatility, but much like a jetpack, takes practice and getting used to. By double jumping, then aiming, dodging and jumping again, we can get a lot of extra airtime and height to clear large gaps. So overall, what do you think? Is it worth becoming an absolute tank of a Mandalorian in this game, or would you rather stick with your two second sandy builds or short circuit netrunners? Let me know in the comments down below, and also tell me, spoiler free, what you think of The Mandalorian Season 3 so far. As always, thank you so much for watching. We've just hit 10,000 subscribers and I want to say a huge thanks again to everyone who's supported this channel so far. I would never have imagined that I'd be in this position when starting up again about four months ago at less than 300 subscribers and in a way it's a little overwhelming but I simply hope to continue making content you enjoy for a long time to come. I'm Sam Bram and I'll see you very soon in another video.